Hey, I'm Tim Clark from PC Gamer, and today we're going to be talking about graphics settings and how to optimize your computer to get the most out of them. The first thing I do with any new game is take a look at the graphics settings. I want to make sure I'm getting the highest quality visuals I can while maintaining a stable frame rate, and the default settings aren't always the best. Finding the right settings for your PC can take some trial and error, but the better you understand what each setting does, the easier it is to make decisions. In this video, we'll run through some common settings, such as anti-aliasing and anisotropic filtering, so that you're equipped to make informed tweaks. The anti-aliasing setting is the most likely to bombard you with acronyms, but its basic function is simple. and monitors are grids of square pixels, and if you draw a diagonal line with squares, it's going to end up looking jagged, kind of like a staircase. Anti-aliasing encompasses all the varying techniques used to smooth out this jagginess. One older method of anti-aliasing is called MSAA, or multi-sample anti-aliasing, and it's more demanding than most. Most modern games use deferred rendering where geometry and shading calculations are handled in separate passes. This causes hardware MSAA to produce incorrect results. Since aliasing is still a problem, new algorithms have been developed. These days you'll often default to a post-processing form of anti-aliasing, FXAA, or fast approximate anti-aliasing is much quicker than MSAA and can still produce good results. Rather than taking additional samples like MSAA, FXAA analyzes the final frame, looks for edges, and then applies a blur filter to try and eliminate jaggies. Similar in principle to FXAA, but with generally better results, is SMAA, or Enhanced Subpixel Morphological Anti-Aliasing. Another popular solution is Temporal AA, or TAA, which analyzes previous frames to help eliminate jaggies. Some advanced AA methods may be specific to your GPU, like NVIDIA's new DLSS or Deep Learning Super Sampling, which requires an RTX graphics card, so uh, get ready to open your wallet. Finally, that brings us to Super Sampling. We're not talking about NVIDIA's fancy machine learning tech, but simply rendering the whole scene at a higher than native resolution, and then downsampling it. You're basically shrinking it to size. Some games will let you adjust render scaling, usually as a percentage, or you can enable ultra-high render resolutions in your graphics card control panel. Increasing the render resolution will make games look great, but will affect performance in a big way. If you tilt a square away from you, the perspective causes it to take the shape of a trapezoid. But in games, textures are stored as squares, and if we try to map pixels from a square onto a trapezoid, the texture is going to look blurry. That's a simplified explanation, believe it or not, but all you really need to know is that anisotropic filtering makes angled surfaces look less blurry. The higher your AF factor, the steeper the angle it can correct for, and it doesn't cause much of a performance hit. There's no point to using high-res textures without good texture filtering, so it's generally something you'll want to keep turned up. However, if you want to try to squeeze out a few extra frames per second, you can safely lower it from the max setting, because it's pretty rare that you'll look at surfaces from extremely steep angles. Unless you're using real-time ray tracing, getting lighting to look believable in games takes a lot of tricks and approximations, like ambient occlusion. This technique darkens parts of the scene where two objects meet, so that not only is there a direct shadow, but also the sense that objects are blocking ambient light. Sometimes the effect can look a bit like a dark halo around everything, which is hardly more realistic. But when it's done well, ambient occlusion adds depth to scenes. The most basic real-time version of this method is called SSAO, or Screen Space Ambient Occlusion to its friends. But you probably want to select the most recent AO solution when it's available, such as NVIDIA's Horizon-based Ambient Occlusion. Whether or not you use any ambient occlusion usually comes down to personal preference. However, AO can often cause a significant impact on performance, so it's a good option to turn down on slower graphics cards. Ray tracing has been used in 3D rendering for a long time, but it's been too slow to perform in real time until now. What ray tracing does is figure out how each pixel on your monitor should look by calculating rays of light that run backwards from the pixel to whatever object they bounced off, and then to a light source, taking into account both the properties of the object and the light source. With multiple light sources, which can include light that is bouncing off nearby objects, multiple rays need to be calculated to color each pixel. NVIDIA's RTX series of cards are able to process billions of rays in real time, and that allows for much more realistic lighting, especially when it comes to reflective surfaces. NVIDIA's RTX cards combine ray tracing with traditional rasterization. So far we've only got one game, Battlefield 5, that uses RTX effects. The uh, initial release cut performance in half, but updated code has optimized things to improve frame rates. Ray tracing will undoubtedly be a delicate balancing act between image quality and frames per second, at least for the next couple of years. Post-processing is anything done to a frame after it's already been rendered, a bit like a Photoshop filter. Shader effects are different, but they're often lumped together with post-processing in graphics menus. Shader effects can add things like depth of field, which simulates a camera's focus distance. 
some of these effects, such as depth of field, can cause your frame rate to take a hit. Others, like motion blur, don't usually affect frame rate all that much, but many just prefer to play without them. Because post-processing can refer to so many things, it's difficult to say how much the setting will affect performance without testing it in each game. If you're almost getting the FPS you want, try turning off or lowering some of these settings to see if you can squeeze slightly better performance out of the game. There's no standardization to basic quality settings whatsoever. One game's ultra quality textures might be another's high quality textures. Texture quality often has the least impact on performance, unless you exceed your graphics card's VRAM, which is actually pretty difficult these days with 8GB cards becoming so common, so texture quality can often be set to maximum. Settings labelled with quality can do many different things depending on the game, so getting them right really comes down to trial and error. In general, reflection quality, lighting quality and shadow quality will affect performance the most after resolution. One thing to be aware of is that sometimes the visual difference between normal and good and ultra quality settings is tiny, while the performance difference can be huge. A smooth frame rate is much more desirable than a minor increase in detail, so don't feel like you're missing out if you have to lower quality settings. Getting a stable and high frame rate is way better than seeing an extra eyelash. So this has just been a brief introduction to the settings you'll encounter most often in games, but if you want to know more about what all these do and how they work, head to pcgamer.com settings.